on World News Tonight. Not guilty. Former US President Donald Trump pleads not guilty to Georgia election charges. Saolo surge. Hong Kong on alert as Storm Saolo churned towards the country as China issues highest weather warnings. Massive fires. Scores reported dead after a blaze in a five-story building which was being occupied by homeless people. And perfect poses. Inside a sunlit studio in India's capital, kittens assist yoga enthusiasts. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight, reporting from Colombo. Here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. A very good evening and you are joining us on World News. Now we start in a chaotic Hong Kong as schools were closed and flights were cancelled as Hong Kong hoisted its third highest storm warning in anticipation of Typhoon Saola, which is expected to brush the city and could be its worst storm in five years. China has issued the highest typhoon warning as Typhoon Saola crawled closer to the southeastern coastline, threatening Hong Kong and other major manufacturing hubs in neighboring Guangdong province. China's National Meteorological Center said that Saola will move northwest across the South China Sea at a speed of about 10 km per hour, gradually approaching the coast of Guangdong, then slowly weaken in intensity. The typhoon also passed by Philippines earlier this week without any reports of casualties so far. However, in the northern part of the islands, the typhoon's torrential rains and Fierce winds enhance seasonal monsoon rains, flooding low-lying villages and displacing nearly 50,000 people, including 35,000 villagers who fled to government-run evacuation centers. Seaports suspended inter-island ferry services due to rough seas, and more than 100 houses were damaged. Saola will make landfall in China along the coast somewhere in Huilai County in Guangdong to Hong Kong. The country has been hit by heavy rain and flooding over the past two months, including that brought by Typhoon Doksuri at the end of July. The deadly storm, one of the strongest to hit the country in years, left a trail of destruction triggering the evacuation of more than 30,000 people from Beijing and causing severe flooding in the capital and Fujian. Now over in South Africa, at least 74 people are reported dead after a massive fire at a building in Johannesburg. A five-story building in central Johannesburg that was being used as informal housing caught fire Thursday, leading to the death of at least 74 people. According to local authorities, 12 of the dead are children. More than 50 others were injured in the massive blaze as the fire is believed to have started at around 1.30 a.m. local time when most of the residents were asleep. Responding to the news of the deadly fire, South African President Cyril Ramaphosa called it a great tragedy and said an investigation would help prevent a repeat of the incident. This incident calls on all of us from the emergency services and other entities of government to reach out to survivors, to help restore people's physical, psychological well-being and to offer all material help and assistance to the residents affected by this. And I do hope that the investigations into the fire will enable communities and authorities to prevent a repeat of such a tragedy. The South African leader said in a press conference that the building used to be home to abused women and children before being taken over by cartels and becoming one of the many so-called hijacked buildings in the city of Johannesburg. Ramaphosa explained those living in the facility were often forced to pay rent to gangs. Many other properties near where the blaze occurred also have houses deemed unfit to live in as they lack running water, toilets or a legal electricity connection. South Africa has suffered a housing shortage for many years with an estimated 15,000 people estimated to be homeless in the city of Johannesburg alone. Former U.S. President Donald Trump has pled not guilty in his Georgia election fraud case, waiving the right to appear in court next week. Mr. Trump is among 19 people charged with a conspiracy to overturn the U.S. state's 2020 vote results. Former U.S. President Donald Trump has pleaded not guilty to a wide-ranging Georgia criminal indictment accusing him of trying to overturn his 2020 election defeat. 
He's also asked to be tried separately from some of his 18 co-defendants. The Georgia indictment, filed earlier this month, accuses Trump himself of 13 felony counts, including racketeering. 18 other defendants, along with Trump, face a total of 41 criminal counts, including falsely testifying to lawmakers that election fraud had occurred and urging state officials to violate their oaths of office by altering the election results. The plea means that Trump will not appear in person at the Fulton County Superior Court next week to face the charges. We did nothing wrong at all. On Thursday, Trump's lawyers asked the judge to sever his case from some of his co-defendants who have sought a speedy trial. This would put Trump's case on a different schedule from that of his co-defendant, Kenneth Cheesebro, a lawyer for Trump's 2020 campaign. Trump's lawyers argued that they did not have sufficient time to prepare for the October trial date set for Cheesebro. Despite four indictments amounting to some 91 criminal charges in New York, Miami, Washington, and Atlanta, Trump remains the frontrunner for the Republican nomination for the 2024 presidential election. Trump has pleaded not guilty in all criminal cases and could spend much of next year in court even as he campaigns to retake the White House. Now, Russian-installed authorities began holding regional elections in parts of Ukraine, which Russia illegally claimed as its own last year, seeking to cement Moscow's authority in what it calls its new territories, despite the ongoing conflict. Local elections are underway in parts of Ukraine that Russia claims as its own. An effort by officials there, installed by Russia, to cement their authority as the war continues. Journalists in the Russian-controlled city of Mariupol watched as some residents cast their vote after showing their new Russian passports to officials. We hope there will be peace. Naturally, I think everyone hopes for that. It's desirable that peace comes as soon as possible. Many have already fled Russian-occupied territories like this. Such areas have seen some of the worst damage of the war. Vadim Boychenko is the exiled Ukrainian mayor of the city. Now in Kyiv, he told that Mariupol residents are being ordered to vote at gunpoint, a claim which couldn't immediately be verified. He calls it a sham election. They're going to walk from apartment to apartment as they did before talking to people. There are two soldiers standing nearby carrying machine guns and they tell the people that they must vote. People open their doors, they get scared and answer, all right, whatever needs to be done, I'll do it. Russia doesn't fully control any of the four regions where the votes are being held, Donetsk, Luhansk, Zaporizhia and Kherson. They each have governors hand-picked by Moscow, all members of President Vladimir Putin's political coalition called United Russia. All of them are now running for full terms in office. Ukrainian officials say the elections are illegal. They say it shows why it's impossible to hold any peace talks with Moscow until Russia withdraws all its troops from Ukrainian territory. Australia's Victoria is at risk of regular blackouts this summer. A grim assessment of the country's electricity grid has warned that major blackouts are due until rapid investments are made in renewable energy. In business, like households, the reaction to power bills is the same. Now, how can they be more expensive? Doesn't make sense. Especially when told our electricity grid is the most flimsy. At the energy market operator, a timely malfunction. We're locked in. We're locked in. As it declares, Victoria's slow transition to wind, hydro and solar puts power supply in jeopardy over a decade. An elevated level of risk, um, in particular in Victoria and in South Australia. As early as this summer. It'll be hotter and drier, so air cons will be in overdrive. There will be less wind, meaning less power from wind farms, as old coal stations struggle. Throw in outages, and that's the blackout scenario. There are emergency reserves. 
But will the minister guarantee there will be no blackouts in Victoria this summer? No minister in the country could. This government was working every single day hard to deliver the energy transition that will keep power bills as low as possible. More than 130 renewable energy projects are in the works here, many though not finalised and not considered in the gloomy outlook. This is not a report that predicts what's going to happen, but it's a map for investors showing them where and when to invest to fill those gaps. These power stations are old and tired. They need to be replaced, and that's the work we're doing. Let's go for a short commercial break. You're watching World News. to tonight's U.S. election updates. With U.S. elections on the horizon, the race to the White House intensifies. As former President Donald Trump dominates a Republican presidential primary, some liberal groups and legal experts contend that a rarely used clause of the Constitution prevents him from being president after the January 6, 2021 attack on the U.S. Capitol. The 14th Amendment bars from office anyone who once took an oath to uphold the Constitution but then engaged in insurrection or rebellion against it. A growing number of legal scholars say the post-Civil War clause applies to Trump after his role in trying to overturn the 2020 presidential election and encouraging his backers to storm the U.S. Capitol. Two liberal nonprofits pledge court challenge should state's election officers place Trump on the ballot despite those objections. The effort is likely to trigger a chain of lawsuits and appeals across several states that ultimately would lead to the U.S. Supreme Court, possibly in the midst of the 2024 primary season. The matter adds even more potential legal chaos to a nomination process already roiled by the frontrunner facing four criminal trials. Now, Iran has accused Israel of trying to sabotage its ballistic missiles program through faulty foreign parts that could explode, damaging or destroying the weapons before they could be used. The Israeli Prime Minister's office declined to comment on the allegation, though it comes amid a years-long effort by both Israel and the United States to target Iran. A report also said that the parts could be used in Iran's extensive arsenal of drones, which have grown in prominence amid their use by Russia in its war in Ukraine. Iran has accused Israel of being behind a failed plot to sabotage its defense industry and production of missiles. Iranian state television reported on Thursday that an intelligence unit of the defense ministry, quote, thwarted one of the largest sabotage plots targeting Iran's missile, aviation and airspace military industry. It said the plot was carried out under the guidance of what it called Zionist intelligence services and their agents. Iran and Israel have been locked in a shadow war for decades, with mutual allegations of sabotage and assassination plots. A network of agents sought to introduce defective parts into the production of advanced missiles, according to an unnamed Iranian Defense Ministry official quoted by state media. There was no immediate response from Israel. Now, a fresh round of sanctions has been imposed by South Korea targeting North Korea, specifically in response to the regime's latest satellite launch attempt. The U.S. also joined the bandwagon. South Korea has slapped a new round of sanctions on North Korea in response to the regime's attempted launch of a spy satellite last month. The foreign ministry announced Friday that the sanctions target five individuals and one institution involved in the regime's nuclear and missile development and funding. This is the 11th round of sanctions put in place against the North during the Yoon administration. So far, a total of 54 individuals and 51 institutions have been put on the blacklist. Newly added to the list this time around is a North Korean company involved in Pyongyang's development of armed equipment and the export of IT personnel, as well as five company officials. The government says that by putting sanctions in place ahead of other countries, it demonstrates its strong will to lead the international community's efforts to block North Korea's development of satellites, drones and nuclear weapons. The ministry stressed the sanctions come with support from Seoul, Washington and Tokyo, as established during the recent trilateral summit, to further strengthen cooperation against North Korea. 
In coordination with South Korea and Japan, the United States on Thursday sanctioned two individuals and one entity involved in generating revenue for Pyongyang's development of weapons of mass destruction and ballistic missiles. The action targets two individuals, a North Korean and a Russian, who have directly supported or helped generate revenue for North Korean organizations that are linked to the development of WMDs, and a company owned by one of the individuals. The U.S. Treasury Department said the action is being taken in response to the North's second failed satellite launch as well. Both Seoul and Washington said they will continue to coordinate closely with each other and Japan, as well as the international community, to ensure that North Korea stops its unlawful and destructive activities. Unending terror in Niger as Niger's ruling junta has ordered police to expel France's ambassador, a move marking a further downturn in relations between the two countries. Niger's junta says they have instructed police to expel the French ambassador to the country. In a statement, the junta, which seized power in a coup on July 26, says Sylvain Ite no longer had diplomatic immunity. The ambassador was ordered to leave within 48 hours on Friday in response to actions taken by the French government that the junta said were, quote, contrary to the interests of Niger. The visas of the ambassador and his family were cancelled, the junta said in a statement dated August 29th and confirmed as authentic by the junta's head of communications. The foreign ministry in Paris responded on Thursday, saying that the Niger coup leaders have, quote, no authority to ask France's ambassador in Niamey to leave. French President Emmanuel Macron said on Monday that the ambassador would stay in the country despite the junta's pressure and reiterated France's support to Niger's ousted president, Mohamed Bazoum. And on Wednesday, hundreds of women protested outside the French embassy in Niamey, calling for France to remove its troops and military bases from the country. They banged on pots and pans, pretended to sweep and chanted anti-French slogans. You can see we've emptied out our kitchens. We've come here with pans and spoons and cooking pots. We're here to say no to imperialism. We were born to colonialism. We're tired of letting the colonizers rule, and that's why we're here. We don't want macaroni anymore, or whatever his name is. I don't even care to know his name. We need another type of base here. For example, Russia. May Russia come here and support us. We need Russia. Like recent coups in neighbouring Burkina Faso and Mali, the military takeover in Niger came amid a growing wave of anti-French sentiment. Welcome back. And for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. At least 16 people were killed in a fire at a clothing factory in the Philippines. The fire started before sunrise at a two-story building which was used as a warehouse and workers' housing for a t-shirt printing business. Pope Francis arrived in Mongolian capital Ulaanbaatar on Friday. The Pope was welcomed by a few dozen devotees and onlookers as he made his way to the home of the local cardinal. A shooting near a shopping center in Austin, Texas killed at least two people with three others injured including one with life-threatening injuries. Pennsylvania police are on the lookout for Daniela Cavalcante who is convicted of stabbing his ex-girlfriend to death after he escaped to Chester County Prison. Ruby Frank, the mom behind the former YouTube channel Eight Passengers, was arrested on child abuse charges. According to the officials, authorities have found a malnourished minor with wounds and duct tape on their extremities. And that is all we have for you on World News Tonight. Join us again on Monday for more news across the globe. If you missed any of today's programs, you can always rewatch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. We are leaving you tonight in neighboring India, where a group of yoga practitioners gather for an hour of yoga with an adorable twist. Thank you for watching. Have a great weekend. <laughs>